Chapter Forty Nine of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. Though Mr. Lawrence's health was now quite re established, my visits to Woodford were as unremitting as ever, though often less protracted than before. We seldom talked about Mrs. Huntington, but yet we never met without mentioning her, for I never sought his company but with the hope of hearing something about her, and he never sought mine at all because he saw me often enough without. But I always began to talk of other things, and waited first to see if he would introduce the subject. If he did not, I would casually ask, Have you heard from your sister lately? If he said, No, the matter was dropped. If he said, Yes, I would venture to inquire, How is she? But never, How is her husband? Though I might be burning to know because I had not the hypocrisy to profess any anxiety for his recovery, and I had not the face to express any desire for a contrary result. Had I any such desire? I fear I must plead guilty. But since you have heard my confession, you must hear my justification as well. A few of the excuses, at least, wherewith I sought to pacify my own accusing conscience. In the first place, you see, his life did harm to others and evidently no good to himself, and, though I wished it to terminate, I would not have hastened its close if, by the lifting of a finger, I could have done so, or if a spirit had whispered in my ear that a single effort of the will would be enough, unless, indeed, I had the power to exchange him for some other victim of the grave, whose life might be of service to his race, and whose death would be lamented by his friends but was there any harm in wishing that, among the many thousands whose souls would certainly be required of them before the year was over, this wretched mortal might be one? I thought not, and therefore I wished with all my heart that it might please heaven to remove him to a better world, or if that might not be, still to take him out of this, for if he were unfit to answer the summons now, after a warning sickness, and with such an angel by his side, it seemed but too certain that he never would be, that, on the contrary, returning health would bring returning lust and villainy, and as he grew more certain of recovery, more accustomed to her generous goodness, his feelings would become more callous, his heart more flinty and impervious to her persuasive arguments. But God knew best. Meantime, however, I could not but be anxious for the result of his decrees knowing as I did that, leaving myself entirely out of the question, however Helen might feel interested in her husband's welfare, however she might deplore his fate, still while he lived she must be miserable. A fortnight passed away, and my inquiries were always answered in the negative. At length the welcome, yes, drew from me the second question. Lawrence divined my anxious thoughts, and appreciated my reserve. I feared at first he was going to torture me by unsatisfactory replies, and either leave me quite in the dark concerning what I wanted to know, or force me to drag the information out of him, morsel by morsel, by direct inquiries, and serve you right, you will say. But he was more merciful, and in a little while he put his sister's letter into my hand. I silently read it, and restored it to him without comment or remark. This mode of procedure suited him so well that thereafter he always pursued the plan of showing me her letters at once, when inquired after her, if there were any to show. It was so much less trouble than to tell me their contents, and I received such confidences so quietly and discreetly that he was never induced to discontinue them. But I devoured those precious letters with my eyes and never let them go till their contents were stamped upon my mind. And when I got home, the most important passages were entered in my diary among the remarkable events of the day. The first of these communications brought intelligence of a serious relapse in Mr. Huntingdon's illness, entirely the result of his own infatuation in persisting in the indulgence of his appetite for stimulating drink. In vain had she remonstrated. In vain she had mingled his wine with water. Her arguments and entreaties were a nuisance. Her interference was an insult so intolerable that at length 
on finding she had covertly diluted the pale port that was brought him he threw the bottle out of the window swearing he would not be cheated like a baby ordered the butler on pain of instant dismissal to bring a bottle of the strongest wine in the cellar and affirming that he should have been well long ago if he had been let to have his own way but she wanted to keep him weak in order that she might have him under her thumb but by the lord harry he would have no more humbug seized the glass in one hand and the bottle in the other and never rested till he had drunk it dry alarming symptoms were the immediate result of this imprudence as she mildly termed it symptoms which had rather increased than diminished since and this was the cause of her delay in writing to her brother every former feature of his malady had returned with augmented virulence the slight external wound half healed had broken out afresh internal inflammation had taken place which might terminate fatally if not soon removed of course the wretched sufferer's temper was not improved by this calamity in fact i suspect it was well nigh insupportable though his kind nurse did not complain but she said she had been obliged at last to give her son in charge to esther hargrave as her presence was so constantly required in the sick-room that she could not possibly attend to him herself and though the child had begged to be allowed to continue with her there and to help her to nurse his papa and though she had no doubt he would have been very good and quiet she could not think of subjecting his young and tender feelings to the sight of so much suffering or of allowing him to witness his father's impatience or hear the dreadful language he was wont to use in his paroxysms of pain or irritation the latter continued she most deeply regrets the step that has occasioned his relapse but as usual he throws the blame upon me if i had reasoned with him like a rational creature he says it never would have happened but to be treated like a baby or a fool was enough to put any man past his patience and drive him to assert his independence even at the sacrifice of his own interest he forgets how often i had reasoned him past his patience before he appears to be sensible of his danger but nothing can induce him to behold it in the proper light the other night while i was waiting on him and just as i had brought him a draught to assuage his burning thirst he observed with a return of his former sarcastic bitterness yes you're mighty attentive now i suppose there's nothing you wouldn't do for me now you know said i a little surprised at his manner that i am willing to do anything i can to relieve you yes now my immaculate angel but when once you have secured your reward and find yourself safe in heaven and me howling in hell-fire catch you lifting a finger to serve me then no you'll look complacently on and not so much as dip the tip of your finger in water to cool my tongue if so it will be because of the great gulf over which i cannot pass and if i could look complacently on in such a case it would be only from the assurance that you were being purified from your sins and fitted to enjoy the happiness i felt but are you determined arthur that i shall not meet you in heaven huh. what should i do there i should like to know indeed i cannot tell and i fear it is too certain that your tastes and feelings must be wildly altered before you can have enjoyment there but do you prefer sinking without an effort into the state of torment you picture to yourself oh it's all a fable said he contemptuously are you sure arthur are you quite sure because if there is any doubt and if you should find yourself mistaken after all when it is too late to turn it would be rather awkward to be sure said he but don't bother me now i'm not going to die yet i can't and won't he added vehemently as if suddenly struck with the appalling aspect of that terrible event and then you must save me and he earnestly seized my hand and looked into my face with such imploring eagerness that my heart bled for him and i could not speak for tears the next letter brought intelligence that the malady was fast increasing and the poor sufferer's horror of death was still more distressing than his impatience of bodily pain all his friends had not forsaken him for mr hattersley hearing of his danger had come to see him from his distant home in the north his wife had accompanied him as much for the pleasure of seeing her dear friend from whom she had been parted so long as to visit her mother and sister mrs huntingdon expressed herself glad to see millicent once more and pleased to behold her so happy and well 
She is now at the Grove. Continued the letter. But she often calls to see me. Mr. Hattersley spends much of his time at Arthur's bedside. With more good feeling than I gave him credit for, he evinces considerable sympathy for his unhappy friend, and is far more willing than able to comfort him. Sometimes he tries to joke and laugh with him, but that will not do. Sometimes he endeavours to cheer him with talk about old times, and this at one time may serve to divert the sufferer from his own sad thoughts. At another it will only plunge him into deeper melancholy than before, and then Hattersley is confounded, and knows not what to say, unless it be a timid suggestion that the clergyman might be sent for. But Arthur will never consent to that. He knows he has rejected the clergyman's well-meant admonitions with scoffing levity at other times, and cannot dream of turning to him for consolation now. Mr. Hattersley sometimes offers his services instead of mine, but Arthur will not let me go. That strange whim still increases, as his strength declines. The fancy to have me always by his side. I hardly ever leave him, except to go into the next room, where I sometimes snatch an hour or so of sleep when he is quiet, but even then the door is left ajar, that he may know me to be within call. I am with him now while I write, and I fear my occupation annoys him. Though I frequently break off to attend to him, and though Mr. Hattersley is also by his side. That gentleman came, as he said, to beg a holiday for me, that I might have a run in the park, this fine frosty morning, with Millicent and Esther, and little Arthur, whom he had driven over to see me. A poor invalid evidently felt it a heartless proposition, and would have felt it still more heartless in me to accede to it. I therefore said I would only go and speak to them a minute, and then come back. I did but exchange a few words with them, just outside the portico, inhaling the fresh bracing air as I stood, and then, resisting the earnest and eloquent entreaties of all three to stay a little longer, and join them in a walk round the garden, I tore myself away and returned to my patient. I had not been absent five minutes, but he reproached me bitterly for my levity and neglect. His friend espoused my cause. "'Nay, nay, Huntingdon,' said he, "'you're too hard upon her. She must have food and sleep, and a mouthful of fresh air now and then.' or well, she can't stand it, I tell you. Look at her, man. She's worn to a shadow already. What are her sufferings to mine? said the poor invalid. You don't grudge me these attentions, do you, Helen? No, Arthur. If I could really serve you by them, I would give my life to save you if I might. Would you indeed? No. Most willingly I would. Ah, that's because you think yourself more fit to die. There was a painful pause. He was evidently plunged in gloomy reflections but while I pondered for something to say that might benefit without alarming him, Hattersley, whose mind had been pursuing almost the same course, broke silence with, "'I say, Huntingdon, I would send for a parson of some sort. If you didn't like the vicar, you know, you could have his curate or somebody else.' "'No, none of them can benefit me if she can't,' was the answer, and the tears gushed from his eyes as he earnestly exclaimed, "'Oh, Helen, if I had listened to you, it never would have come to this. And if I had heard you long ago, oh, God!' How different it would have been. Hear me now, then, Arthur, said I, gently pressing his hand. It's too late now, said he despondingly. And after that another proxism of pain came on, and then his mind began to wander, and we feared his death was approaching. But an opiate was administered, his sufferings began to abate, he gradually became more composed, and at length sank into a kind of slumber. He has been quieter since and now Hattersley has left him, expressing a hope that he shall find him better when he calls to-morrow. "'Perhaps I may recover,' he replied. "'Who knows? This may have been the crisis. What do you think, Helen?' Unwilling to depress him, I gave the most cheering answer I could, but still recommended him to prepare for the possibility of what I inly feared was but too certain. But he was determined to hope. Shortly after he relapsed into a kind of doze, but now he groans again. "'There is a change.' Suddenly he called me to his side, with such a strange, excited manner, that I feared he was delirious, but he was not. "'That was the crisis, Helen,' said he, delightedly. "'I had an infernal pain here. It is quite gone now. I never was so easy since the fall. Quite gone by heaven.' And he clasped and kissed my hand in the very fullness of his heart, but finding I did not participate in his joy, he quickly flung it from him, and bitterly cursed my coldness and insensibility. "'How could I reply?' Kneeling beside him, I took his hand and fondly pressed it to my lips, for the first time since our separation, and told him, as well as tears would let me speak, that it was not that that kept me silent. It was the fear that this sudden cessation of pain was not so favourable a symptom as he supposed. 
I immediately sent for the doctor. We are now anxiously awaiting him. I will tell you what he says. There is still the same freedom from pain, the same deadness to all sensation where the suffering was most acute. My worst fears are realized. Mortification has commenced. The doctor has told him there is no hope. No words can describe his anguish. I can write no more. The next was still more distressing, in the tenor of its contents. The sufferer was fast approaching dissolution, dragged almost to the verge of that awful chasm he trembled to contemplate, from which no agony of prayers or tears could save him. Nothing could comfort him now. Hattersley's rough attempts at consolation were utterly in vain. The world was nothing to him. Life and all its interests, its petty cares and transient pleasures, were a cruel mockery. To talk of the past was to torture him with vain remorse. To refer to the future was to increase his anguish. And yet to be silent was to leave him a prey to his own regrets and apprehensions. Often he dwelt with shuddering minuteness on the fate of his perishing clay, the slow piecemeal dissolution already invading his frame, the shroud, the coffin, the dark lonely grave, and all the horrors of corruption. If I try, said his afflicted wife, to divert him from these things, to raise his thoughts to higher themes, it is no better. Worse and worse, he groans, if there be really life beyond the tomb and judgment after death, how can I face it? I cannot do him any good. He will neither be enlightened, nor roused, nor comforted by anything I say. And yet he clings to me with unrelenting pertinacity, with a kind of childish desperation, as if I could save him from the fate he dreads. He keeps me night and day beside him. He is holding my left hand now, while I write. He has held it thus for hours, sometimes quietly, with his pale face upturned to mine, sometimes clutching my arm with violence the big drop starting from his forehead at the thoughts of what he sees, or thinks he sees, before him. If I withdraw my hand for a moment, it distresses him. "'Stay with me, Helen,' he says. "'Let me hold you so it seems as if harm could not reach me while you are here. But death will come. It is coming now, fast, fast, and oh, if I could believe that there was nothing after!' "'Don't try to believe it, Arthur. There is joy and glory after, if you will but try to reach it.' "'What? For me?' he said, with something like a laugh. Are we not to be judged according to the deeds done in the body? Where's the use of probationary existence if a man may spend it as he pleases, just contrary to God's decree, and then go to heaven with the best? If the vilest sinner may win the reward of the holiest saint by merely saying, I repent! But if you sincerely repent— I can't repent, I only fear! You only regret the past for its consequences to yourself. Just so except that I'm sorry to have wronged you now, because you're so good to me. Think of the goodness of God, and you cannot but be grieved to have offended him. What is God? I cannot see him or hear him. God is only an idea. God is infinite wisdom and power and goodness and love. But if this idea is too vast for your human faculties, if your mind loses itself in its overwhelming infinitude, fix it on him who condescended to take our nature upon him, who was raised to heaven, even in his glorified human body, in whom the fullness of the Godhead shines. But he only shook his head and sighed. Then, in another paroxysm of shuddering horror, he tightened his grasp on my hand and arm, and groaning and lamenting, still clung to me with that wild, desperate earnestness, so harrowing to my soul, because I know I cannot help him. I did my best to soothe and comfort him. Death is so terrible, he cried. I cannot bear it. You don't know, Helen, you can't imagine what it is because you haven't it before you. And when I'm buried, you'll return to your old ways and be as happy as ever. And all the world will go on just as busy and merry as if I'd never been while I— He burst into tears. You needn't let that distress you, I said. We shall all follow you soon enough. I wish to God I could take you with me now, he exclaimed. You should plead for me. No man can deliver his brother, nor make agreement unto God for him. I replied. It cost more to redeem their souls. It cost the blood of an incarnate God, perfect and sinless in himself, to redeem us from the bondage of the evil one. Let him plead for you. But I seem to speak in vain. He does not now, as formerly, laugh these blessed truths to scorn. But still he cannot trust, or will not comprehend them. He cannot linger long. 
He suffers dreadfully, and so do those that wait upon him. But I will not harass you with further details. I have said enough, I think, to convince you that I did well to go to him. Poor, poor Helen! Dreadful indeed her trials must have been, and I could do nothing to lessen them. Nay, it almost seemed as if I had brought them upon her myself, by my own secret desires. And whether I looked at her husband's sufferings or her own, it seemed almost like a judgment upon myself for having cherished such a wish. The next day but one there came another letter. That, too, was put into my hands without a remark, and these are its contents. December 5th. He is gone at last. I sat beside him all night, with my hand fast looked in his, watching the changes of his features, and listening to his failing breath. He had been silent a long time, and I thought he would never speak again, when he murmured, faintly but distinctly, Pray for me, Helen. I do pray for you, every hour and every minute, Arthur, but you must pray for yourself. His lips moved, but emitted no sound. Then his looks became unsettled, and from the incoherent, half-uttered words that escaped him from time to time, supposing him to be now unconscious, I gently disengaged my hand from his, intending to steal away for a breath of air, for I was almost ready to faint. But a convulsive movement of the fingers, and a faintly whispered, Don't leave me, immediately recalled me. I took his hand again, and held it till he was no more. And then I fainted. It was not grief, it was exhaustion, that, till then, I had been enabled successfully to combat. Oh, Frederick, none can imagine the miseries, bodily and mental, of that deathbed. How could I endure to think that that poor trembling soul was hurried away to everlasting torment? It would drive me mad. But, thank God, I have hope, not only from a vague dependence on the possibility that penitence and pardon might have reached him at the last, but from the blessed confidence that, through whatever purging fires the erring spirit may be doomed to pass, whatever fate awaits it, still it is not lost, and God, who hateth nothing that he hath made, will bless it in the end. His body will be consigned on Thursday to that dark grave he so much dreaded, but the coffin must be closed as soon as possible. If you will attend the funeral, come quickly, for I need help. Helen Huntingdon End of chapter 49